And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster that makes up match play games, creators of the upcoming Legends the Superhero RPG, and, and the two best known as Chad and Jack Machete. How are you two doing today, man? Pretty good, pretty good. Doing excellent, thank you. Oh, yeah. It's actually, it's actually pronounced Smith, though. <laughs> no, I'm, he's, I'm kidding. He's just, I'm he's kidding. Just, he's yeah, just, I, yeah, I knew. <laughs> wish I could, wish you could see my face. I'm like, uh, I'm just giving you this, just giving you the stare over that. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I wish, I wish it was Machete. I think that would be really super cool. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's so many, so many uh, iterations of of our last name. So I can, I can understand that, given, my, given. The way people screw up my own real name. Um, <laughs> plus, you plus you are le you are legally required to have bad jokes. Well, because I'm Absolutely. a dad. Exactly. Yes. Well, I'm not even a dad, and even I, and even I have some dad jokes in my arsenal. It's good to have a few in the back pocket. Oh, uh, well, it's just about knowing your audience, but. I'd like to start out with the humble beginnings, and so, some of this was dip, was dipped into on the Kickstarter page, but I'd like to go a bit further with it. <clears throat> Walk me through your origin story with role-playing games and what made it stick. Sure. Um, Jack, you want to take it or you want me to go? You go for it. Okay, well, I um, uh, I started playing uh, RPGs back in, in high school. Um, way back in the dark ages, and uh, it's, you know, of course, started with with D and D, and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, uh, a couple of my buddies um, found a game called Villains and Vigilantes, which was a superhero role playing game, and um, uh, we just absolutely loved it. So we played that for years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when uh, Jack got old enough, and and my daughter Emily as well, when they got a little old enough. Um, I introduced it to them, and uh, and they loved it. Um, and then uh, we also uh, used to play City of Heroes and just anything superhero um, mm -hmm. was uh, was fantastic. Um, I backed actually, ironically enough, I backed a Kickstarter for a for a game um, for a superhero game, and uh, we waited and waited and waited, and we got finally got the the tier reward, and it just. I think it was like two or three years after backing it. Yeah, yeah, it took a long time, um, and it just wasn't what we were looking for. It was it was a little confusing, and 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 again, I forget which one of us said it, but they said, you know, we should uh, we should just do our own then. And so we just kind of looked at each other and said, oh, okay. So it started. It really just started sitting around the kitchen table, um, you know, <laughs> throwing throwing stuff on the sheet and and just playing and having fun just the two of us mm -hmm. and it just kind of grew from there um then uh i think it was jack that said you know we should we should like make a book and uh okay so yeah so it's been about five years um endless endless play testing the, the endless changes to what we you know first that first night when we got around the kitchen table but um uh, yeah, it's it's just kind of grown into this this beast. So mm -hmm. here we are. And what? <clears throat> and what about you, Jack? Oh, um, yeah, same thing. Basically, it just um, like always playing games when I was younger um, with Chad, and then um, we just kind of it, like we would always kind of do our own like homebrew rules here and there, and we always liked like the aspects of game design and comic books and superheroes and stuff. So it just kind of, in my opinion, it was just kind of a natural progression into um, eventually doing some some game design and creating our own thing. Mm-hmm. Now, given given the superhero relationship that you, that you t that you two have, I'd like to play a little bit of a lightning round at t regarding um regarding super regarding superhero role playing games and superhero 
video games and ju just if if you're familiar with these if there's a, if there's anything if there's anything that comes to mind with it consider it the gaming version of a Rorschach test huh. all right sounds good um we are we already mentioned city of heroes so champions both of them have um, tried champions online a couple of times um but overall not not my favorite and i think city of heroes is the number one and probably always will be for as far as superhero games go mm -hmm. yeah i um i tried champions years and years and years ago uh my buddies and i when um you know we were still playing vnv &V and we just kind of you know not not turned up our noses at it but that, no we prefer this one uh, and we never, I don't think we really ever gave it a chance. Uh, same thing with the online. I, I tried the online version after City Heroes um, closed up shop years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I just couldn't get into it. So There were plans from Alderac, of all people, to do a City of Heroes RPG, but, um, it, ne but it, never ca it never came to fruition. And all that I have on that is just a PDF of the demo that, that um, got distributed. Yeah, it's interesting. the 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 whole city of heroes um, uh, story is is so fascinating that you know it actually w was doing well. I mean, there was a comic of it. There was it seemed to be gaining speed, and then NCSoft bought it. And uh, things that I've read on it, um, they shut it down because they felt it was taking market share away from some of their other fantasy properties. Oh. And um, you know, which just seems crazy to me. Yeah, oh. <clears throat> NC Soft is not exactly known for go for good long term decisions, and um, even though a lot of the people involved with it would jump over to Cryptic, something f something about the way Cryptic has worked in the years since has always felt off. And the fact that they've that they've pumped out a fair amount of, a fair amount of MMOs, and none of them have really been able to stand out bes besides having certain IP and well that that little experiment with Magic the Gathering didn't even get out of early access so I get I yeah, guess and I think the, the the City Heroes property um, since it's come back on you know the free servers and um, there's so many people like the community is huge and uh, it just seems like a missed opportunity for all those years yeah <clears throat> But so this one, this one might be a bit of a left fielder, but Freedom Force. I am not familiar with that one. Um, Freedom Force was the was an attempt to mix a a bit a bit of a a bit of a skirmish RP, a bit of a skirmish RPG with with supers. It got it got one expansion that was that was a bit more pulpy. Oh, I'm just looking up now. I've I've heard of this. Um, I've never played it though. All right. Um, those are the two big ones that I want I wanted to cover when it came to the video game end of Super's game, since a lot of the other a lot of the other superhero games are gonna be as far as video games go are gonna be um, ones with obvious IP. If you catch my drift. Yes. <laughs> yep. Um. So shifting away from that. Um. In regards to tape, in regards to tabletop supers, to give to give a few names, um, Marvel Phase Rip. Marvel Phase Rip. Phase Rip. Um, Phase Rip. Basic, oh. basically, basically uh, TSR TSR Marvel superheroes. Yep. Um. I we tried that again back when I was in. It came out back when I was in high school. The the first the first version of that, and um, we we gave it a whirl and. Again, it wasn't really to our taste. Um, we kind of modified it, my buddies and I. Uh, we modified some of the the modules uh, and converted things over to to like a to 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 go with a VNV system. Mm -hmm. um, just again, homebrew. Uh, so we had fun with that. It was kind of cool to you know play against Sentinels and and that sort of thing, but uh, um, didn't play the actual game. Yeah, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the guy behind VNV has been in the temple in the past. Um, but um, DC Heroes. 
Uh, same, same, same thing as 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 the Marvel game. We 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 tried uh, to kind of homebrew some of the things to fit uh, the VNV uh, game back in when I was in high school, but uh, did not did not play the actual rules. Mm -hmm. um, mutants and masterminds. Uh, mutants and masterminds. I've I've looked into a lot and never played it, um, but did look into it a lot and like how they did their system and mechanics and stuff like that when we were designing um, legends. And um, but uh, we've we've never played it, or at least I've never played. It. I don't know if you've played it, Dad. No, I haven't either. Yeah, I think the the, the tough thing is is that all these games that were out there, um, we really did like. Uh, the, the the villains of villains of vigilantes game that um you know that I grew up with mm -hmm. and uh, so um weren't really interested in 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 other ones other than how we could adapt it to existing storylines or existing uh, paths that we were on um, so uh, <laughs> a little bit little bit uh, um, sheltered view on them I think all right I I can certainly get that now. With that, with that in mind, when I when I looked at the setting design for New Olympus, I I kept get I I will admit the City of Heroes analogy that you brought up earlier is ma made a bit more sense looking at looking at that, and it's certainly it's certainly an approach that I can appreciate because a lot of a lot of supers games I've I've seen have tried to go go one of go one of two routes either you have su you have supers just coming up just coming up or you tr or you go a bit or you go a bit of a deconstructionist route whereas with something like new olympus um you have the concept of supers being around for quite a while yeah so um in in the lore like superheroes um before the um powers that be act um where you could actually legally register as a superhero like in new olympus there was superheroes and in the rest of the world there were superheroes as well and it's just new olympus is the first country to offer actual registration to the point where they've actually completely pretty much replaced their police force they, they have superheroes who um, go out on patrol and help out with crime and things like that. And they still have, like, regular officers who do, like, traffic enforcement and things like that. But um, for actual, like, burglary and stuff like that, it's all it's all superhero-based. And that started in uh, the mid-'90s. So they've been around for, like, properly registered and everything almost 30 years now. Mm -hmm. I think the thing was also that Jack and I... Um we you know one of the things we wanted to do was have the, the the biggest and most detailed possible sandbox for players to play in um it's not just you know uh and this is again coming from you know back when i was in school there wasn't necessarily a lot of details um other than this is how you make your 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 hero or this is how you make you know whatever your character now go play mm -hmm. and then there would be modules that come out Whereas in New Olympus, um, you know, the backstory is there. Like, the city itself is a character, really. Um, we even include a whole bunch of, you know, prominent companies uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the city itself that you, you can play with if you want or you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of NPCs that are in the book, uh, are, it's huge. There's, there's over 150 of them um, with character sheets and everything. So, again, you, you don't have to play with them, but... You can if you want. You can you can you know make your sandbox right to begin with quite a rich experience, um, and and lots of options. Yeah, one of the things, um, just to touch on that, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was um, creating the lore and the history of New Olympus all up until like present day, so that you can really just jump in right with a bunch of knowledge about what's going on all the way up to present, and then create your own superhero story going forward. Mm-hmm. And I do appreciate that whole, that mindset of this of the city as a living thing because well you look at it you look at any supers you look at any super story any superhero comic and that and <clears throat> the city that they, that they are supposed to be protecting is as much of a character as the superhero themselves 
whether that be Coast City for Gre for Green Lantern, um, Bloodhaven before it went to shit for um, for the question, and the obvious stuff like Metropolis, Gotham City, New New York City, and so on. Exactly. Like I always I always really enjoyed in in the comics, you know, reading when um, there would be, you know, issues of of Superman where where they they go to star labs right okay i know what star labs is that's great i know you know what they do there i know the situation it just the more stuff that, that they have that comes back and is familiar i think it just aids in the storytelling mm -hmm. and certainly there are players out there that they just want to make a character and, and beat the crap out of each other right mm -hmm. great that's totally fine but we also wanted to cater to the players who they wanted to be more story driven they wanted to be uh, to have that environment to uh, to play in, and um, with uh, we do a, the actual play podcast, um, and Jack GMs it, and he does a great job of painting that picture and using the resources in the book to create basically a whole a whole you know a whole universe of of uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. Now within the, within that, I'm guessing I'm guessing that. You also that the city also has its fair share of factions. Oh yeah, there a lot of a lot of like enemy factions. Yeah, there's um oh off the top of my head, uh like five or six different enemy groups that we say like where they operate in the city and uh, the different uh, villains that operate within them, and then there's also like supervillain teams and supervillains on the whole that just go after the entire city as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, now one of the things that's brought up within within the lore is that you e you'd either have to complete superhero registration with um, Powers Division or be a vigilante. Uh, are both of those options supported within the rulebook? As far as yep. what as far as what the consequences for either would be. Uh, so we, we do talk about that in the New Olympus section, how in the idea of... The, so there's actually a few more ways you could be a superhero as well, but those are kind of the two main ones. You either register and do training through Powers Division um, over like a three to six month process, or you can just kind of work outside the law and be a vigilante. And there is... Um, there is stuff in the book talking about how, in that case, working outside the law, like the powers division, other superheroes could come after you as well um, because you're not legally operating. But then there's also things that we like super contracts. Like you might be contracted by a company or by like a private individual who needs some security or needs a strike team to go do this or that or something. And then you can operate um, and legally use your powers um, in that regard. No, oh, all right. I can I can get behind that. The other oh. thing is is the, the vast majority of of you know uh, powered individuals in in New Olympus. Um, there's a large percentage that that they may be powered, but they're not necessarily superheroes. Um, mm -hmm. We thought it would be really cool to have a, a you know a place where you know somebody who is is super intelligent um, maybe they're maybe they're a doctor or somebody who's super strong works in construction uh you know this this type of thing so there's there are people who the whole new olympus that's full of or has lots of powered individuals but they're not necessarily all heroes mm -hmm. because you know again it's kind of it's kind of boring just to be all uh you know oh i got powers i'm gonna be a hero mm -hmm. well no not everybody would do that so and not saying that those would necessarily be the you know the 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 player characters obviously but uh, it just gives it uh, a bit of a more of a, a rich background yeah and i know you i know you mentioned villain factions but i want i'd want to go into heroic factions as well and it sounds it sounds like that's accounted for what with the many routes that can be taken as far as doing hero work for sure, yeah, and and they're not so much factions like in the traditional sense, um, more so options, um, kind of for the flavor of your story. So there's not um, like huge faction rules. It's much more flavor based for how the GM wants to weave the narrative and how the players want to play. Like if you want to play as a group of vigilantes that are always like one step ahead of other superheroes in their quest for justice and stuff like that, that's absolutely um, allowed and supported and encouraged. 
uh, within the rules of the game and like how you want to play in your version of New Olympus. Mm-hmm. And I'm get I that I that I think is very important because I've seen this kind of thing happen with certain games that have a strong setting where they end up where the setting ends up being a little too strong and the avenues that one might appear to have to bring in the player characters is lessened um the meta plot problem as it's been referred to mm-hmm. no we have yeah. we tried to when designing it um we tried to th- keep in the back of our mind everything needs to have options mm-hmm. because You know, in the same way as when you're designing your hero, some people, you know, love a type of hero like a Superman. Other people love a type of hero, you know, like a Batman or like a Daredevil or whatever, right? So comic books intrinsically are that you have your, you know, different power levels, different different avenues of how you want to do your heroes. Like, are you... Do you open up a shop and like you know Luke Cage and and uh, and Iron Fist and have your your, your heroes for hire? Are mm-hmm. you you know that type of hero? Uh, do you you know sign up with the government and and work exclusively for them? Do you so having those options open um, to try to have as many paths as people you know can take uh, to give them the the flexibility? Also, we think that that helps with game replayability, like. You know, not all your campaigns necessarily will be the same. You might want to try more of a vigilante-based hero one time, or you might want to try a corporate, corporately sponsored hero. You know, like a Booster Gold or something, mm-hmm. uh, that type of hero another time. So it just leaves it wide open for um, for how you want to play. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of, speaking of that, I'd like to go. I'd like to go into a bit of the mechanic end of things, because the most that was the most that was said on that front on the Kickstarter page was it being a D twenty based system, which tells me a little. The die mechanic tells the die use tells me a little bit, but not as not as much as some as some people might think. So when it comes to this D20, are, are we talking standard roll high compared to a static target number? Are we talking roll? Lo- are we talking roll low? How are how are you going about it? So um, it is roll over um, mechanics, um, but also one important distinction is if there's ever a tie, all the ties go to the player. So for example, if um, they might have a static number in combat to beat because um, you're rolling uh, over your target's defense. So if your target's defense is 15, for example, and your player rolls a 15, then they still hit them. Whether if your player's defense is a 15 and I as the GM roll a 15, we tie, I don't hit them. So it, it, so we do that to make them feel a little bit more super is that ties always go to the player. And then in skill contests, um, it is either a static number If you're doing kind of something against the environment, for example, like say you're trying to break down the door, I as the GM or um, would come up with a static skill contest number, say it's 30 or 35, and then you roll plus your full strength score to try and bust it open. Or if you're going against another character, both whether it be a friendly character or an NPC or, or whatever, both characters would roll the skill contest and whoever gets higher ties still going to the player um, uh, win the contest. So it is, um, it is always roll over, but um, it can fluctuate between static or if it's uh, person against person, then it could be a variable number. Mm-hmm. We also, and Jack just talked on a touch on a little bit there. Um, we don't we don't have modifiers or, or things like that for your skills. Uh, any role you make is based off of it's just added to the entire skill number. Because um, and actually uh, this was an example Jack used a, a little while ago. Uh, you know if you have a character you know a Hulk like character with super strength, um, obviously when he rolls he or she rolls, and they add it to his overall you know, strength number, it's going to be much greater probably than if it's somebody like a, like a Hawkeye rolling a strength roll. Right. So, um, we didn't want to worry about doing modifiers and that sort of thing. You just, your, your skill score is your skill score. 
Yeah, mm. and then that affords bigger numbers, which um, we found that a lot of people like. It makes them feel even more super when they're like, I got like a 40-something on my skill contest, and they absolutely crush it. Yeah. Now, since you're, since you're using the old 20-sided die, are you keeping with the idea of natural ones are automatic successes, natural... Or, or natu um, natural automatic failures, sorry, and natural 20s are automatic successes? Yes. Um, so so that's a crit fail, crit success. Um, but also in combat, uh, if you roll a critical success, you do your full damage plus a roll of your regular damage on top of it. So say you're rolling, you've got fire powers, and you're uh, throwing a fireball at somebody and does 1d10 damage. You hit the nat 20, so you're going to do 10 full damage plus a roll of 1d10 on top of it. Because we found that, like, the worst thing ever is when you get that nat 20 and you roll, like, say you roll 2d10 and then you get two ones, and you're like, oh, I did two damage. So you do your full amount plus another roll on top of it. And I, I can, I can certainly get behind that. Oh, it should, it should feel special, right? It should feel, it should feel really cool, and uh, that's a lot of personal experience. <laughs> yeah. Other way. <laughs> it should feel special, especially it's something that statistically is happening only five percent of the time. Like it should, you should feel like a, a bonus. You should feel special for it. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to now. This brings me to a bit of a big elephant in the room that's decided to crash on my couch. And that is the fact that it's very difficult to do sim to do relatively simple character creation for a supers game because of how many moving parts are going to be involved in the sheer variety of powers that are go that are going to be present. Um some games will take the point by approach, which has its own which has its own drawbacks. Um, some games will just throw caution to the wind and just say "swim, damn it," and then say, "Okay, okay, I know you're drowning, but stop doing that." <laughs> um, so, when it comes to character creation, have you guys give have you guys considered putting in um, a set of archetypes to kind of let people build around the first few times through before they jump really into the deep end of full custom? So we have a template that everybody follows upon um, character creation, which makes it a bit easier uh, to follow. Um, we also have, um, we do have an archetype system, but that's for role-playing aspects, and we'll touch on that later. Um, and we do also have starter characters, so you can just pick up a starter character that's ready to go out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, and then also on top of that, at, at character creation, we do recommend thinking about what team role you want to fill. So if you want to be that classic Superman type, or maybe you want to be more gadgets and and training uh, powers based like Batman, things like that. So if you're thinking about that kind of character type in mind, so we don't we don't have classes, but if you're thinking about that character type in mind, then that helps eliminate a lot of the overwhelming amount of powers and abilities that come with the character creation because then you can break it down like if you got okay i really want to play a superman character you know you're probably wanting like uh enhanced strength flight things like that so it automatically it helps you start to create your character mm -hmm. and then um with the template um uh we have different campaign settings so say you want to play like a really nitty-gritty street level campaign you might go with a low campaign setting and there's there's four settings low medium high and godly um and to use the low example you would get less power points because it is a point by system to purchase your powers but you get less points less starting health and stamina and less starting skill points for your skill point pool and then from there, we break it down step by step. You choose your powers first with the power points you have available. And the powers are split into three separate tiers with each uh, powers in those tiers costing a certain amount of points to them. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then you move on to doing your skill pool and doing your filling out your skills. And then you move on to your role-playing aspects with your archetype and things like that. So we break it all down in the book to try and make it as uh, easy as possible uh, for character creation. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, you mentioned you mentioned roles. What would 
those roles be if you can give me a few examples uh so the different uh idea of the character roles um would be uh like your your classic brick your sniper your stealth character your control character and your support character so it, it with those um five aspects oh and your like your wild card character so with those like six aspects in mind it, it starts, you start thinking, okay, like if I want to really play like a control, like a crowd control character, I'm probably not going to take something that is just like a one-on-one. -on -one. Like I'll probably be looking at like things like plant control where I can control lots of, um, or, or, or earth control where I can like shake the earth for like a big group of people and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it really also comes down to, and Jack, you, you touched on it briefly there. Um, we do talk about in the book, the, the easiest way to do it short of, you know, We've played a couple of games recently, actually, where uh, the players are brand new to the system and they just picked a starter character to play with. And so that was the easy jumping off point. But once you're making your own custom character is to really just think for a second of what type of superhero do you like? You know, mm -hmm. um, do you like a Captain America? Do you like a, a, a Johnny Storm? Do you like, you know what I mean? Like, and then so that you, you automatically then, yes, there's a lot of, there's a hundred different powers to choose from, but that that narrows it down considerably. Mm -hmm. And with, with that in mind, when I, when, I, when I looked at the sample regarding powers, it looks like you guys are going with a letter grade based tier system instead of, instead of um, point, instead of point level approaches. Am I yeah, reading have, that correct? Yes, yeah, so we have, uh, there's three different tier levels for the powers. There's 25 A tier powers, 50 B tier powers and uh, 25 C tier powers. Now your A tier powers are things like, you know, invulnerability, immortality, um, you know, things like that. And then your B tier, um, uh, you know, uh, invisibility, flight, uh, you know, precision, all those types of things. And then your C tier powers are um, a little more, a little more, you know, gadgets and, and that sort of thing, like Jack was saying earlier mm -hmm. about a little more street level. Now, with that in mind, could, I'd like you to give me one example of e of each tier, so I so people could get a idea of what the tiers power scaling might be. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, um, think in, in C tier as much more personal or smaller based, like things like trained power. So, so a good C tier example would be like fight training. So you've learned some kind of martial art or, or something like that. And that gives you a small bonus to your hand to hand, um, damage and also your, uh, like hand to hand accuracy. Mm -hmm. And then a B tier power would be a more powerful, um ability so you might have something like but it still mostly affects you or like one other target so something like uh flame powers you might be able to cover yourself in a flaming shield or blast a single person with flames um and there's a whole bunch of and there's more abilities that you can unlock while you're level, leveling up and then an a tier power is something that is very very powerful that is affecting you like something like immortality or something that can affect like um potentially at the higher scale of the world itself so something like gravity control being able to affect the gravity of everybody in a room or everybody within a certain area of effect and there and usually with, with the a tier powers there's much more abilities that you can unlock so there's um it, it kind of increases in scale that way mm -hmm. and just touching on the the abilities jack too um one of the things one of the drawbacks but it was just the way the game was with the Villains of Vigilantes game is that, um, you know, if you picked, and we, we always seem to use this example, but if you picked flame powers in that game, this is what you could do. And that was it. Whereas we wanted to make sure, because with flame powers, like some people might want to play a human torch-like character where you can let yourself all on fire, you can fly, you can sh whatever. Other people might want to play a pyro type character where you can, you know, just control the flames and it comes from an external source. Um, so it was important to us to have that custom custom ability uh, to try to cater to all the different views and all the different um, favorites that people have and how they want to play the games themselves. Mm -hmm. Which definitely make definitely makes sense. Now you mentioned you mentioned leveling up. Is are you guys going with a leveling system or are you going with um, 
exper experience as currency kind of approach. So there, there is a leveling system, and um, we actually, um, to really sell the idea of you're starting out just as a fledgling hero, you started at level zero, mm -hmm. completely fresh, level zero, and you work your way up, and there is 15 levels in the book, but it's a very easy pattern to follow, and we point that out in the book as well, so if you want to take it above level 15, you absolutely can, mm -hmm. and what you do is, um, upon leveling up, you gain two training points, and with the training points, you can use that either to unlock a new ability, enhance an existing ability, um, or uh, increase a skill level, or even you can bank them and save them up to purchase new powers in the future. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, every three levels, you get a hero point, which a hero point can be used both in combat or skill contests or as an extra training point. Uh, and then at levels 5, 10, and 15, you unlock a new character mastery, which masteries are little uh, kind of boons that uh, they each have three tiers to them that you can unlock over three levels. And they give you bonuses um, kind of across all of your abilities and across your entire character. Instead of, well, like as enhancing a singular ability, you could take a mastery to enhance all your abilities, for example. Yeah. So... With that in mind, I'd like to pick your brain on a, on a few classical archetypes and how those might translate into legends. For sure. Um, and I'll start with the power armor approach, you know, um, Iron Man, War Machine, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Dad, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, with armor, it's 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 funny in our in our podcast, the the preeminent super team in Legends is the Vanguard, and um, one of Jack's characters that uh, that he plays quite often uh, as an NPC in our podcast is a character called Knight, who mm -hmm. uh, uh, very very intelligent individual and makes his suit of armor uh, bases it off of uh, historical armor, so medieval armor, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, with a high-tech flair, of course. With a high-tech flair, yeah, of course. So, yeah, so things like armor, you know, and there's a tr different choices with that power. Uh, it can be, you know, like a power suit. It can be, um, you know, pieces of Kevlar or, or, or whatever. Or it can be natural armor as well. Again, it's, it's all flavor-based and mm -hmm. uh, um, up to the individual who's creating their character to create the hero that they want to be. So... Um, you know, and there'd be a certain number of armor points that come with that. Um, there could be, uh, you know, different attributes that it that it has. Um, you know, it's the sky's the limit, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, one of the things is there's there's five origins, power origins in the book. You've got uh, genetic, um, trained magic science and technology and we encourage that when you're coming up with your powers not only do you come up with the flavor behind them how they look and feel and sound and everything is you also come up with an origin for them so you might have a character who is just all genetic based they just naturally have their abilities almost like a mutant or it's passed down through their family and that might be all of them but for example with knight genetically he's super smart but all the rest of his powers like his armor and his power blast and his flight all come from his armored suit which come from technology so you can have multiple origins for different powers within your superhero mm -hmm. now let's go let me go with the, let me go with one of the eight let me go with one of the age-old classics and that is the the old the old pulp style costumed adventure and early batman is one is one example but also also characters like the phantom would fit into would fit into this approach I know I'm probably 100%. doing a deep cut by bringing up the Phantom, but it is what it is. No, 100%. Um, I, again, it's all it's all flavor based. If you want to make a hero that, you know, <laughs> wears a wears a purpley suit and a domino a domino mask, uh, that's totally cool. And you can, you know. It, the the different power or, um, tiers the A tier B tier C tier mm -hmm. um, when you're creating your character a power in the A tier uh, costs you four power points in the B tier it costs you two power points and in the C tier it costs you one uh, power point 
um, and then you get your power points based off of the the level of campaign that you're you're playing. So, if you want to make a you know a character like the Phantom, who I, I'm not totally up on my Phantom lore, but I believe he you know he has a he has a gun and um, I don't remember if he's actually enhanced at all. But uh, you know you could certainly. Um, you know, we also, oh, sorry, in the, in the different tiers, like we have A tier strength, B tier strength, or C tier strength that you can choose from. So, um, you know, whereas a, a character like a Superman might be an A tier strength character, maybe the Phantom is a, is a C, t C tier strength. So it's just enhanced a little bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, plus, a uh, combat training with, uh, or weapons training with a gun or that sort of thing. So exactly. So, so say you're playing like a, a high level campaign. So you start off um with with all your power points and say one person wants to create a superman style character well they've got their vulnerability their a tier strength their flight and and things like that and then they're kind of limited because they're spending all their power points on the really big like high um cost powers and then you have somebody who wants to play batman who with a c tier power only costs one and they load up on like fight training combat training gadgets willpower and like all these like things that just and they have a whole bunch of um uh smaller powers that round them out more if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah i i can get th i can get that now if somebody want if somebody wanted to do the cl the classic mystic approach, you're you're full you're full on mat you're full on magic using superhero a la um, Doctor Strange, Zatanna, Doctor Fate, Constantine. Um, how would they go about that? Because magic in su in supers games is always one of those tricky ones. For sure, yeah, and um, you can go one of two routes, or you can go both routes. Actually, is is you could choose the powers that you want, and say they come from magical origin. There's also like a magic items power there as well, um, where you create your own custom magic item, and you could say like, say I have invisibility and power blast and things like that, and it's like, okay, those are my spells. Or there is an A tier power called magic spells where you have a couple of starting abilities like a magic blast and things like that but then what you do with it is you pick and choose not full powers but singular abilities mm -hmm. from other powers in the game as you level up that become your spells so while you don't get the entire power you get the singular abilities and that becomes your spell that you know so it's it's a completely customizable power set based off what you want in your spell book. And then those would, of course, since it's magic spells, they kind of have to be the magic origin. But yeah. <clears throat> now, speaking of speaking of that, when it another another one that I'd want another one that I'd want to go with is the good old fashioned speedster. Cause because when you're do when you're dealing with a turn-based system. Trying to present somebody who's able to move crazy fast is tricky. Um, we, we we do have. The, oh, do you want to take this? <laughs> sure, I, I I can jump in. Sure. Um, so unlike unlike uh, you know, say like a D and D where you roll uh, your number and that's you just cycle through um, for your initiative. Yeah, your initiative. Um, we have an initiative score that uh, that we, when you roll, you you add to it. So characters who are who are speedsters or maybe they're highly agile, they get a bonus to their initiative score. Mm -hmm. And so, and our initiative system is everybody rolls their numbers, adds it to the initiative score, and then we subtract ten from that score. And so the subtraction, you know, if you if you say roll. You know, you have initiative score of, say, 15, and you roll a 20. So your initiative score for that round is going to be 35. So you go, and then everybody gives their numbers, and then the GM subtracts 10 from each of them. So you would go on, on turn 35, on turn 25, on 15, and 5. And so, you know, and, and whatever the highest number is at that time, they, they would go first. So with a speedster or somebody who's highly agile, they would have a higher initiative score. So they might go a couple of times more than somebody who is your standard, you know, tank uh, and, can, and can do more damage. Because it would make sense that a character, you know, in the style of the Flash or Quicksilver would be able to do more things in a turn 
they might not be as powerful as somebody else, but they could probably do more things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, or a Spider-Man, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, when it comes to heroes, making sure making sure to include weaknesses is just is just as important as including powers. I mean, in the case of Superman, we can't we can't talk about that without bringing up Kryptonite. And I'm curious how these how superhero weaknesses would um, come into play. Is it a case where they where they grant where taking them would grant um, points to spend on powers, or are you guys taking a different route? So uh, we went back and forth a lot when it came to adding weaknesses to the book because originally we had a weakness kind of system where you could either take a narrative weakness or a mechanical weakness and we thought that every character kind of needed a weakness and then as we were play testing we realized that that didn't make really make a lot of sense because you might have taken one character might have taken a mechanical weakness say they have um a minor disadvantage so a minus three to their accuracy and skill contest when they're in a certain environment or when they're in contact with a certain material or something that's a very mechanical straightforward weakness versus a narrative weakness what if your character what if you're playing a werewolf where you turn you can turn into you know, um a werewolf or a um, monster and that's your superhero form only at nighttime what happens in that case when all of a sudden your GM wants to do something during the day and you just can't use your powers at all? So we ended up going away from the idea that everybody needed a weakness and instead want to present it within the idea that the GM can weave... Um, because characters are not without their flaws when role-playing, so having flaws is something that uh, we have in the archetype system for role-playing, and the GM um, should weave into the narrative of like how your character is presented with certain flaws and how that could lead to weaknesses narratively with your powers. Um, but only occasionally, because we don't want it to be like straight up half the time. You can't, ju you just can't use your powers. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it, it, with having hard and fast weaknesses, we've actually gone away from it and removed it from the book. They were there originally, and we just found it really wasn't working for the type of superhero game we were trying to create. I can I can get that because while some while some heroes throughout fiction certainly have their more blatant weaknesses, others it's a little bit more tricky <laughs> exactly right and and something like another narrative weakness like maybe you have your uh mary jane style person where if they are constantly being held hostage you always have to go and try and save them well that can really restrict you in your actual role-playing choices because you feel shoehorned into the idea that well this person has shown up that's my weakness. I have to save this person. So now I have to ignore everything else that's happening in the scene. And that's not even like a role-playing choice because that could be a really strong role-playing choice. You have to go save this person. But if it's like a, an actual thing on your character sheet that says, if this person shows up, you have to go save them, that just that doesn't feel fun then because there might be something else that you want to do as a player. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now, given what film came came out earlier this, earlier this month... Um, if somebody want if somebody wanted to take the take say the vampire route and as tempting as it would be to bring up Morbius, I'm gonna throw a bit of a curveball and say what if they wanted to take a few notes from say Blade? Um, how would you go about that? Uh, so one of the C tier powers we have, so we kind of go under the assumption that you are playing a human but there is rules and we do say like you you can realistically there's no like race rules like in D, &D. um you can play whatever race or species you want to and if you do choose to play an alien or a vampire or a monster, there is a C-tier power called species power where you are quite literally not human. And and that is a kind of a custom small power that you come up with the GM that um, is both could have some mechanical implications, but is more of a narrative based power. So, for example, say you were um, a... Um, uh, from uh, Atlantis or something, you might have gills and be able to breathe underwater and also survive the crushing uh, weight of the ocean and the, and the pressure of the ocean. So um, in that sense, that's how often are you going to be doing adventures underwater and things like that? Well, if you have a power like that, we think that the GM should have 
kind of weave into the narrative more opportunities for things like that but yeah there is the species power so that if you do not want to be human you have that and then you can come up with a power along those lines mm -hmm. that's cer that certainly makes sense and shifting away from the templates for for a moment one thing i saw in the bullet point list that i was a bit curious about is is um guidelines for custom ability creation for signature moves which signature moves is something that su that um some games have touched upon but i don't see it touched upon with supers games yes so, so um signature moves is one of our very like favorite mechanics that we've created um and i'll, I'll let you touch on it more dad <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, we we just we enjoy it when uh, people are creative, and so yes, it's great that you know. For instance, one of our uh, one of our um, one of our characters is is super strong on the podcast, and okay, she punches people, and that's and that's great. Um, but she uh, decided that she was going to um, do like a like a super stomp, um, and so uh, you know when you try something new or you try something different or you try something inventive with your powers, um, we feel you should be rewarded for that. So, um, uh, you can add that as a signature move on your sheet. Uh, the first few times you do it, you gain extra experience points from it. Um, uh, you know, two characters on our podcast have worked out a tandem thing that they do together. So they're able to actually do more damage because their damages are combined because of this joint, um, similar to like a fastball special like wolverine and colossus exactly yeah and so it's just to encourage it's just to encourage pardon me just to encourage people to you know think outside the box and it's not just okay we're gonna fight so i'm gonna punch them mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it's it's what can i do that's exciting what can i do that's different i mean certainly if you want to just 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 punchy punchy that's fine too but um we want to reward people for for thinking outside the box exactly yeah and, and like so you have your existing abilities um but if there are some things that you find that you're like well i really want to do something like this we don't want you to be limited and be like well i only have my abilities to, to go it's like no please create a new one and then that's unique to your character mm -hmm. and the the other thing that i could that i certainly appreciate that was presented with that is the whole custom ability creation because as meant for as many variety for as many varied abilities that there's going to be in the book there's only so much you can stuff in there <laughs> <laughs> true absolutely yes and i mean there's there's already a lot there's 100 powers and over 650 abilities and enhancements to go from um, divided between the powers. So uh, there is a lot to choose from, but we don't pretend like we've created everything or, or figured out everything or anything like that. So it's, it's, we, we highly, highly encourage you to be creative at your own, at your own uh, table. Uh, yes, your, you in your own game. You haven't fallen into the trap that GURPS apologists fall into of, oh, GURPS is the only game you need for any, for any role-playing um, scenario. Exactly. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, this is this. You can tell a darn good superhero story in, and it's superhero based. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a few optional rules that you guys hint at that I wanted to touch on as well. The first one, of course, being nemesis rules. Yeah, um, so Nemesis Rules is an option for leveling up. If you prefer to do things more milestone-based rather than just getting experience points, one of the rules and options we have in there is very similar to you have basically a supervillain nemesis and while you may have gained enough experience if you're following experience points or your gm thinks that and narratively it's time for a good milestone um, of leveling up you are not actually allowed to level up until you face off against your nemesis and defeat them in combat and that way your nemesis levels up around the same time that you do so your nemesis stays at the same power level and is always a threat to you um but narratively then you're over coming your nemesis and then you get to level up on that mm -hmm. now that pre with that in mind the next one that i want to ask is on the injury system and i i suppose this is a good as time as any to ask if you guys are doing a standard hit point approach 
Yes, uh, okay. there is hit points and stamina points. So when you roll to hit, you get hit, and then you roll how much damage you do based on the damage dice attributed to the ability that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, and, each, and then each power, each power you do, or each action you do, costs a certain amount of stamina points. Um, so what's interesting, I always really enjoyed, uh, you know, in reading comics and and that sort of thing. You know, for instance, just as an example, like a Kitty Pride when she first uh, first came and joined the X Men she would be exhausted after using her powers. But as she, you know, gained more experience and, and then she could use them at will. And then to the point where she eventually could start carrying, you know, theoretically as she's leveling up, start carrying other objects and phase through the walls. Then up to she can carry a person through and you know, as she's phasing through the walls, that sort of thing. Um, so you start out, you know, a little bit, a little bit low on the stamina and, and the hit points level because theoretically your your character is you know, probably going up against more street level type threats. Um, but as they gain more experience, those things will grow and they can do more. And it would be, it makes sense that their, uh, their powers aren't as taxing as they would necessarily be when they first started out. So mm -hmm. everything has a stamina cost to it. Yeah. Um, and then with the injury system, uh, our injury system, we decided to, um, a lot of things are more narrative based. This does have some mechanical, um, attributes towards it, but it is, it is narrative as well. So the injury system affects your skill levels primarily because your skill levels come, um, are a good measure of how your body is doing. Right. So, um, say maybe if you are playing with injury system, you have an absolutely atrocious crit fail on something, you might get a major or minor injury. And a major injury would subtract five points, while a minor injury would subtract three. And say you're doing a speed contest and you're trying to race against time to get underneath the trap door and you fail and you fail spectacularly, you might get a minor injury. Say you tear a muscle and you would get a minus three to your speed score. So that would subtract that would mean that your initiative score drops temporarily your movement speed would drop temporarily until you can actually uh heal yourself and um go through and how long it takes to do that is up to the gm and how narratively you want to role play it um it could be as simple as like taking a recovery or just resting and healing up pardon me um but um it could also take a while. You might need to role play some rehabilitation and, and things like that uh, to get your speed back up to, or maybe it's permanent. And then you just, through leveling up, you have to slowly build it back up again. Mm -hmm. Now, with, the, with that in mind, since you mentioned stamina, um, is it a, the question that I always have whenever you have a limited resource in that regard is how you make sure that players don't have don't end up having either the oh, mega elixir paradox or also known as the rainy day paradox or um the nova issue i'm sorry what's the no i don't know the nova issue <laughs> um going nova is a is a term that's been that i've seen bandied about for years it's when Players play um, very defensively until the B bag shows up, and then they throw everything at it. Um, also known as Alpha Strike in BattleTech. Oh, okay, okay. I think, yeah, I think that's. I mean, a lot of this comes down to. Uh, I think we said several times in here. Um, you know, keeping it, keeping the narrative, keeping the story driven. Um, it, it comes down to GM also, you know, controlling things and, and um, there's a, there's an interesting dynamic in, in doing things with superheroes that maybe isn't in some of the other fantasy type games and stuff is that you do have characters of such varying powers. So a lot of it comes down to GM's discretion on, on what can happen. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the player, there's nothing really to say that the player can't, you know, hold back, hold back, hold back, and then do something big, but there's also no guarantee that that would be successful as well. Yeah. And I, I can, cer I can certainly get behind that. Now with that, in, with that in mind, the, uh, the third one that I wanted to get into as far as optional rules is power dampening. Which I have some visual ideas on how that would work, but I'm 
curious as to your take. Yes. So power dampening is actually an optional power as well. And this is, it's in the optional rules as an optional power to see like if your GM wants to include it, there is mechanical power. There's an actual mechanical power. It's an A tier power that your characters could take and you could be able to power dampen certain areas and within that we break it down by origin so like if you you could power dampen like just magical powers in this uh in this area and so on and so forth um with power dampening from a gm perspective we have it in the gm section that it is a very powerful narrative tool to use but it should be used sparingly because the there becomes a point um where characters just kind of i don't want to say it just have a bad time but if you're constantly power dampening your characters so that they're in situations where they can't use their powers well they're there to play a superhero game where they can use their powers so it can be very narratively um impactful on your story but we do suggest to use it sparingly and how the power dampening works is uh with your skills so you wouldn't be able to use your powers at all and then with your skills there is a powered and unpowered column so you would revert back to that unpowered column when using your skills when you're uh power dampened which certain which certainly makes sense um now you guys you guys no, no, no. have go ahead I was just gonna say, touching on the, um, sorry, I was just thinking more about your your stamina question and the going Nova and that sort of thing. Um, the game is is very much stamina based, and we do have a, a, a an optional rule in there as well that you can do an all out attack. Um, there's great moments in in comic books where a character will, you know, they just absolutely go for broke and they, you know, give it everything they got, and the attack is huge and it does potentially does more damage, and they're exhausted afterwards and maybe can't do anything else for a little while till they recover. Um, so we do have optional rules in the game about you know double, triple, quadruple stamina attacks. Um, now the thing is, you still roll like you regularly would roll, and hit or miss, you're taking off that extra stamina that you've put into those attacks. But it just lends itself to more of a superhero type environment that mm -hmm. you can, you know, make the big play if you try. You know, try to make the big play uh, if you if you want as well. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys, as as I understand it, you guys are shooting for over 300 pages regarding the page count. Yes. Um, so I can actually look at our rough layout, the last rough layout we got, which comes out to be... Uh, sorry, just got to open it up here. It comes out to be about 320 pages long altogether. Mm -hmm. And... What are you guys shooting for as far as a release window? I know it's I know it said um, June twenty twenty June twenty twenty two, but because um, because looking at the timeline, it looks like you guys are very are very far into it. Yes, um, and that's one thing that we wanted to do. We wanted to wait to launch on Kickstarter until we had a good majority finished up and so we are we are um kickstarting the final layout proofs and editing pass and also the print run mm -hmm. um because um so often there's there's games that come out and um you back them and then you only get fulfilled like two or three years later and we really wanted to avoid that so we've tried to on our end um go as far as we can to avoid things that will take up more time like doing um more layout passes and things like that like we're just waiting for the final pass to come in um and that's what we're working on right now and we just want to avoid any logistical obstacles so that when we receive the final layouts and editing we can approve them this month and then we can move straight into printing in May and shipping in June. And we're still totally on track for that it's because we wanted to be able to fulfill to people as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And then post that, uh, our release window, we're looking at probably um, releasing uh, um, the actual book in July once the once backers are fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I will be looking forward to seeing how it, how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. 
Thank you so much for having us. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, thank thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And if and anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>